Okay, so you've read the script. Okay, um, what's what, what we're about to go through here is exactly how you're supposed to go about doing this, and also going to go through how you actually uh, how this thing is actually constructed. So it makes it a little bit easier for you in the long run. Right. One thing you'll notice if you look at page um, page eight, and if you turn the and if you turn the page after page eight, you notice that page eight. Page eight lays something lays something out for you, and page nine and ten is where you're going to answer it. If you go to page eleven, there's another part of your answer, and if you go to page twelve, there's another question. You are basically faced with two questions in your script analysis. You have a question has several parts, but each of the one you either it's either an actor or a non-actor. They're the two roles that are in drama. You're either one or the other. You're either on stage or you're off stage. Okay, if we have a look at question one, the actor. It says here, you have been chosen to form the character of Jess or Alex. Both these characters can be portrayed as male or female. Name your character in the space provided below. Always read the instructions. So, if it says put your character there, it actually means write your character there. All right, and may that may seem ridiculous. So many people just ignore that, okay? Everybody laughs, ha ha ha. I'll get it right, and then they don't do it. <laughs> you need to portray. You need to portray a believable character in a realistic relationship. That should be the first key for you. You have to portray a believable character in a realistic relationship. You should know instantaneously we are talking about full bore representational theatre in terms of who the person is and what they're doing. Do we just okay? make up a character? No, you are no. This is a character, one that you choose, Alex or Jess. Oh. You are to represent them as a believable character in a realistic relationship, as opposed to a presentational drama where you don't have to do that. Use the information provided in the drama in the drama text. Summarize using dot points how you would. Number one, develop your character in rehearsal using one key drama process. You have not done a key drama process yet. On Thursday. We are doing a key drama process with the character from your monologue. If you have not chosen your monologue, all you have to do is choose it and read it and get a bit of an idea of the character. If you have not chosen your monologue by Thursday, then you're going to operate in a vacuum. All right? Well, I've asked you... Excuse me. It means you're going to operate without knowledge of what's going on. Okay? The important thing to Thursday is that if you have an idea of what your monologue is, if you've read it, if you've picked it, doesn't matter if you're not going to do this one all the way to waste. If you're happy with that monologue, stick with that monologue for now. Just read it. Get an idea of a sense of who the character is. Don't worry about trying to pull it apart, deconstruct it or anything like that. Because on Thursday, we are going to do that. So you just need to know who your character is and what's basically going on okay. with so the character. So just read it and then that's how it Know who the character is. Okay. okay? So in other words, don't just read it and go... Whatever. Read it and say, okay, this is a boy or a girl, it's an old person, young person, they're going through this situation. Okay? All right. Next thing. So develop your character. We are going to do the Cree drama process. Excuse me. Excuse me. Don't talk. You're going to do the key drama process on Thursday. Use valve communication techniques to portray a believable character. And I put this in your critical reviews. Verbal communication is voice. That's drama terminology. It's in, your, it's in everything that we do. So verbal communication is voice. When you break voice down, it's pace, pitch, pause, tone, and in some cases, projection. They are basically the four or five Ps of voice. Um, and then it says use non-verbal communication to portray your character in a realistic relationship. Facial, consider facial expression, non-verbal being movement, facial expression, posture, gesture, movement, and use of space. Now, we've talked about these sorts of things before. So, in addition, three marks be allocated for justification. Two marks for use of drama terminology and language, and three marks for communication skills. Okay, so that's why it tells you exactly what your marks are going to come from. Most importantly, if it you know when we when you look at the marks of water for each thing, you know that a mark is basically water for each key point that you make. If you're dealing with voice and you're working with pace, pitch, pause, or tone, you know that a mark is going to be awarded for each um, specific um, every every bit of justification you give for each one of those things. You're highlighting that, talking about it. Yeah, we're going to show you how to do it. All right? Okay, so, uh, justify your choices with evidence from the drama text referring to lines of dialogue and action and any other relevant information provided. Now, 
Also, use short sentences, use short answer form, write the space provided, do not write outside the lines, space is provided. If you require additional space, um, spare answer pages can be made available. All right, now turn the page. Okay, now this is how it's laid out. Okay, this is how it works in drama. You have whatever you're supposed to do. In this particular case, if you look at the first one, it says how I would develop my character in rehearsal using one key drama process. And then it says justification. Now, when we talk about justification, we're talking about, okay, this is what you're going to do. Why are you doing that? Why did you make that decision? In drama, there always has to be a reason why you make that decision. Why we can't go through the key drama process yet and go through justification, I won't worry about that too much yet because you don't have, you know what we're talking about there. But if we go over to the next one, it says, how I would use vocal, verbal, vocal communication techniques to portray a believable character and justification. Now... This is going to relate directly to the script. And it's going to re relate directly to page 6 of the script. All right? And perhaps, perhaps, page um, aspects of page 7 being the playwright's intention. All right? Now, reading through um, Parent and Child, Jess and Alex, if we really read through that and consider it from a from a um, an actor's point of view, it's not going to be that hard to sort of sit there and say to yourself, "Okay, um, what is actually going on here?" In terms of what is happening in the piece, we start at the beginning. You know, if you look at the if you look at the scene direction, it says Jess returns hair wet, hair wet and bedraggled, followed by a business person. Alex, Jess throws down the surfboard, but somebody throws something to the ground, which is valuable, like a surfboard. You know straight away that they're in a particularly um, aggressive. Well, not so much aggressive, but an emotive state of mind. We tend to be we tend to use the word emotive more than we labeling um, um, it's aggressive or that because it may not be aggressive. Someone who puts drops it could be frustrated. They may be angry. They may be fed up. So be very careful about how you hand things out without further information. Saying that someone is is in an emotive state of mind is a good way to start. You know, it's a good way to think. Remember, when it comes to conflict, there are three types of conflict. You guys probably know what they are. There's obviously man versus himself, internal conflicts. You know, there's man versus man, which is, you know, having a conflict in a relationship. And, you know, man versus his environment. So, you know, whatever goes on there, external pressures from the world, things like that. That's sort of like, that, the three conflicts. Whenever you're dealing with a representational situation, a realistic conflict, you know that there's, there's all three either exist in it or at least two of them do. A person is always in conflict with themselves. Always. If you're doing a monologue, a person's always in conflict with themselves in the monologue because it's an internal, it's an internal thing. Monologues are saying what a person thinks. So there's an internal issue there. Then in terms of whether it's man versus man or man versus environment, it may be a, a, a monologue which deals with somebody else, which talks about their relationship with someone else, which in which case is there's an internal conflict and the external conflict. Or it might be man talking about the pressures that people put on them and the fact that the world wants this from them, in which case all three conflicts exist in that monologue. So on this one here, a similar type of thing. We may have, we have obviously, there's two conflicts there. We know there's a conflict internally with Jess and internally with Alex because they have something to say. So they've obviously been thinking about something and something's been really you know, eating at them and they're going to say it. So there's an internal frustration there. That's conflict. Any that a person, any turmoil that a person feels inside, that's an internal conflict. Then if they're dealing with someone, that's an externalization of that conflict, okay? So she's dealing with, Alex is dealing with Jess, and Jess is dealing with Alex, and they both have issues with each other. So there's your external conflict. And I think in this piece here, we'll also see, Alex has a, you know, believes a society expectation of what will happen to Jess. So there's a little bit of an external conflict. But if we go through it, it says, um, Alex, the first line is, it's a cop out, a fine excuse to waste your life. Jess's next line is, you're jealous. This thing gets straight into it, right? There's no mucking around. There's no build up to a, to, a, um, to a conflict. This conflict begins from the minute that they speak, all right? So their dialogue is highly emotive. What you would do when you read this piece, before you even start answering the questions, knowing that it's a, an actor, and knowing you're gonna look at verbal communication, non-verbal communication, the first thing you do is you get a pen and you start drawing all over it. You start saying frustrated, angry, um, sad. Um, you know, you start really finding all the emotion in the piece. That's really critical because 
finding the emotion in the piece lets you know straight away what's you know straight away when you start answering the questions what you're going to be dealing with. Um, in terms of voice, now once we've done emotion, then we say, okay, well now we're going to do with voice. What's really important here with voice is we talk about pace, pitch, pause, and projection. Now you know, and we've said to you before, that full stops, grammatical stuff, really tells you what how a person is going to say something. So the next thing you do is go around with a pen and you circle all your grammatical stuff. You know where all your full stops are, exclamation marks, any of these grammatical things, because they start to tell you, you know, what is going on. When you see an exclamation mark, you know that's a that's a really strong statement. It's an exclamation mark. If it's just a full stop, then it's something different. If it's a question mark, it's a question, all right? And these sorts of things are really important when you start thinking about the way someone speaks, especially when you start dealing with things like pace and you start dealing with pitch because, um, and tone. We know that there's always a tonal change at the end of a full stop. So if I say something now and then I say something later, that was a full stop. I changed my tone, all right? And I said that to you all through doing Rome Speak. Rome, I said, look, there's a tone change here, you've got a full stop. All right, so remember that. And while it doesn't become obvious, so so important to you before, it starts to become really important once you start breaking scripts apart. Okay, so you just break it down like that. And then the other thing you can do is because it's movement, you can start underlining and sort of saying, do this here, do this here. I think the character would do this here. Now, remember the other day, um, I said, look backwards and look at that sheet on the wall. And I said, Stanislavski, and I said to you um, how it works. And he said, you know, first you look at the thing, you look at a character, you think, how would I react in this situation? Then you think, okay, if I was a character, how would I react in this situation? And that is the best way to deal with these sorts of things. Once you've decided who your character is going to be, so if you say my character is Alex, then you have to take on the role of a parent. You think, well, if I was a parent, how would I feel after you've read that about Jess? And then sort of, then once you sort of saying, well, this is how I would feel, then start thinking, well, okay, I'm Alex. How does Alex feel about the situation with Jess? And vice versa. You know, you're a teenager, so it's probably easy for you to do Jess. You say, well, okay, I'm faced with a parent that's trying to tell me to stop doing what I like doing, to start doing something which everybody else thinks is a good idea. How do I think I feel? You know, it comes pretty clear there that Jess isn't very impressed, you know, with what people want her to do. She just wants to live her life the way she wants to live it. Um, but then think, okay, well, that's how I would react. But how would you know, how, now, I'm Jess? How does Jess feel about this? All right, and then you you know you sort of start by by doing all that. And honestly, it takes you about five minutes to do that, ten minutes max to go through a script and just go not happy, yeah, frustrated, angry, sad, you know, um, conflicted, whatever. Just write as much information on your script analysis as you possibly can if you're faced with that situation, and then that makes it much easier. Then, okay. We've done that, we've gone through our script, and let's go to page 10. It says here, how I would use both communication techniques to portray a believable character. My belief with all these sorts of things is, you know, um, I always start this type of thing with a short answer, which is briefly, briefly um, thinks, reflects what I think of what's going on in the text, right? So by a short answer, I mean something like this. Okay, now let's say I'm making an opening statement. Okay, my opening statement might be something along the lines of, uh, might be something along in terms of short answer, um, the conflict between the parent and the child regarding future. Plans um, revealed in highly emotive conversation. That's it. That's my opening statement. I'd make a short opening statement. I'd say my understanding of what actually is going on. So to me, this is how I'd write it. You'd probably write it differently. But the thing to take from this is notice there's no intro here. There's no, I think, what's going on? They are four or five words which are irrelevant. Mine is conflict between parent and child regarding future plans revealed in highly emotive conversation, or I could say, you know, confrontational. You know, that's it. The person who's reading that knows straight away that you understand 
what's going on in the piece. If you don't understand what's going on, then you don't have a clue. But if you've read that piece, and it's really not that hard to work out, each one of you would be able to make a short statement about what you think is happening. Wouldn't be that hard. Okay? Right, then I would go as far as I'd start talking about voice, all right? And I'd start talking about pace. And my, let's say my character is um, Alex, right? Right, Alex, um, pace um, is, um, if, um, is, how does she talk? You don't really care about much no, no, you just get straight into it. Alex's pace is, um, I'd say, you know, we've got Alex. Um, Alex's pace is um, is measured and um, slow. No, it's really good that you're all talking about food when you should be concentrating on this. Is measured. Um, and this is reflected in short lines, short dialogue, short lines of dialogue, sorry, lines of dialogue. I'd be better this whole sit down actually doing it. Now, that's what I put down there. Then it says justification. Now, I might have more than one on pace. I might have a couple of, a couple of points on pace. All right? Now, in terms of justification, I would actually put down you know, specific sentences that Alex would say. But I wouldn't write down the whole sentence. So, for example, I'd go, um, uh, in justification, I'd put um, demonstrated. Um, it's a cop, dot, 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 dot. To, um, to the line there, it says, um, your lie. So we don't have to write the whole sentence, we can just no, write the first bit. No, you just go dot, 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 dot. There's not enough room to write the whole sentence. But the most important thing to get from this is there is nothing flowery about what I've done. Everything is banged straight onto it, okay? All right, that's the most important thing. You know, I could also deal with pace. I could have gone, you know, if I'm actually going to sit down and write an exam here, I might say, well... You know, I might talk about pace in terms of you know Alex's frustration and how you know and how pace works in that particular thing. But do you understand what I mean when you're dealing with this? It's not nothing you say is really wrong, as long as you have a base to say it from. If you're saying the person speaks quickly, you know, their their pace is quite quick and you know it's it's um it's not halting and just speaking quickly. Um, they're nervous, you know. They're, and then you show the justification text where you think that happens, then that's right. Because that's what you've recognised. If you say a person is speaking slowly, right, and it's drawn out, reflected here in the text, then you're right. You know what I mean? As long as you're, as long as you're quite specific about what you're talking about, don't write me. Don't write some huge page on pace. And some, you know, amazing clarity. No one's interested. You should. You should be able to. If you look at this, if you look at this script, there is a reason, there is an absolute 100% reason why you're given that much space. Because that's all the space you need if you're doing short answers. You don't need a ton of space. What you need, you know, I could fit those two things in here, and then I talk about pitch, and then I talk about tone, Right, so that's how you do it. All right, so if you're writing more than that, it's because you're going, well, today, after reading the script, I felt as though, you know, for some of you seem to need this whole... So it doesn't actually have to be, like, full sentences. <coughs> no, it's full sentences. Not. Everything is in it's note not. form. It's notation. So you're basically making it easier for me to get along. Well, because you need... It's basically just getting right to the meat of it. You're telling me exactly what you think, you know, about pace. You're telling me exactly what you think about movement about gesture. You tell me exactly what you think. This gesture is revealed here, or gesture of um, Alex pushing your hair through here. Justification yeah. is yeah, examples? Hey? Is but, justification like Yeah, example? justification is examples from the script. So you can quote it? You can do lines, yeah. So I did lines. You can even say, you know, if you're doing movement, you can say, um, scene direction like, you can say, um, um, aggressive movement from Alex at the beginning, um, reflected, you know, justification. 
seam, seam, um, the seam direction, she throws surfboard to the ground. Okay? So that's a justification for you thinking that she's, her movement is quite aggressive at this point. All right? You know what I mean? So that's all you have to say. You say, okay, I see that. This is why she did it. Okay, they did that. This is why they did it. This is why I, so, this is why I think so this is what's happening. So like justification first and then... No, no, justification is second. You say what it is first, then you do justification. Okay? It's written on there. It's written there. See that? It's written there at the top. Justification. Don't confuse the two. People have confused the two. Okay, turn the page. So, okay, that goes. Now, we're going to go through this again next week, by the way. All right? I want to go through this twice with you because what happens is this week you'll get it and then you'll go, oh, yeah, all right. And then halfway through the week you'll go, mm, not really sure. You come back next week and we look at it again and then you go, okay, I really do get it now. I really understand or I don't understand. I'm not asking you to answer any questions or anything. I'm just asking you to have a good read of it again towards the end of the week and just put points down that you don't understand. Because it's not about whether you're answering any questions right on this, it's whether you're answering questions right in the exam. Right? So just anything you don't understand about this, you can spend five or ten minutes on this and just go, don't get this, don't understand this, don't understand that, Re repeat this, and we'll go through that in class on Monday. That way you, you know what's going on. Okay, question two is non-actor. This script exert of beach, the actual fantasia has been performed on a thrust stage. Now, you will obviously, the reason why we did spaces and stages is because you actually do need to know what spaces and stages are and what they mean. So this is being made on a thrust stage. A thrust stage goes out, it's past the proscenium march, it's way past that, it's thrust out into the audience, okay? It's a thrust stage. If you look at the stage, this one has four entrances and exits off the, top of the, off the thrust stage itself, right? There's four platforms. Okay, the production team is staging the script excerpt in a presentational style. Notice it's put in thing, which, no, which you all know means it's been done, been staged in a non-realistic way. Okay? Obviously because we can't bring in tons of beach sand. So, we can't do it on the beach. And you can't really represent a beach realistically because it's very hard to bring a whole ocean on the stage. So everything has to be symbolic. It's non-presentational. And that's the thing. If you actually start to think about it, think, yeah, well, obviously, you know, it's going to be done like this because you can't do it the other way. Um, but once the stage, the scene between Alice and Jess as representational, as realistic, so what does that tell you? When you read that, what does it instantly tell you? Now, before you answer, when you think about staging, what, in, what is involved in staging a performance? Come on. Yeah, stage is one. What else? Props. Props. What else? Um, lights. lights. What else? Costume. Sound. What else? Costume. All right, so when we talk about staging, this is very important because sometimes when people think staging, they actually mean just the stage itself. But when we're talking about staging a performance, we're talking about everything that goes that goes towards making that performance a performance. Okay? So the production team is staging the script excerpt in this and so when we're talking about um, a shift from presentational to representation in terms of staging, what what aspects will we try to make realistic? The costume. The costume. What else? The acting. the acting. What else? Possibly the set. No, no, no. But what you can do is you can't make a beach, but you could try pretty hard to create a realistic beach atmosphere with the set. So you might require. So with sound, you might do a beach soundscape. Seagulls, things crashing, people laughing. You know, you might try to create that beach soundscape. This is very important, okay? Because it's a shift from presentation to representation. That means the lights go out and there has to be a scene change. It has to be a set change. And you know what? If you were doing set for this and you didn't say that, you didn't say that you know, on the blackout there would have to be a set change, then you'd be wrong from the beginning. Now, let's go through this. You have a non-acting role in the production team. Dry, director, dramaturge, or designer. Now it says all design and then either lighting, sound, costume, or stage. In other words, one of those, not all four of them. Is that for the designer? Yeah, if you choose designer. So you pick one. Yeah. Identify which particular role you are focusing on in your answer. This is what I've said to you. You need to know what dramaturgy is because it will come up time and time again. 
Don't, that's why I don't give you anything that wastes your time. If I've told you to research a dramaturge, it's because you need to know what a dramaturge does because there's a, a better than even chance it'll be in your exam. And you don't want to sit there and go, well, what's a dramaturge? All right? Okay, what processes does a dramaturge do? All right? Outline how you would show, one, the overall presentational style of the script excerpt. If you're director, then you're talking about how you would stage that all over, how, the vision that you have. Director's vision. Okay? If you, are, if you are dramaturge, you're talking about what you think needs to be done to create symbolic elements, this, 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 this. Okay? So dramaturge and director, it's a fine line between them. They both are looking at the overall concept. But the dramaturge is looking at more from kind of like, this is, what, this is what's actually out there. Whereas director's more about what I want to do. Alright? That's the difference. You get that? Yeah. Okay. If you're looking at it from the role of a designer, then you say costume design. Okay. I'm looking at costume. And only costume. You're not looking at lighting in costume design. You're looking at costume. So deal only with costume. Right? So overall presentation style of the script. So you're going to deal overall, if you're doing costume, overall how it's going to look and also how you're going to represent representational aspects. Okay? All right. Presentational character of the poet in scene six. All right, so how, depending on what role you have, how are you going to um, do the character of the poet as a presentation in scene six? It's not that complicated. As a director, you would need to think about movement. You would think about the way he works with the audience. As a costume designer, you need to think about what he's going to wear. As a, um, in, in, you know, in thing to everybody else. As a lighting person, you might be thinking, how am I going to, you know, make it all about them? could use a follow spot. I could do whatever I want. Yes. If you're the director, yeah. can you talk about like their costume and stuff and like yeah. the use of the stage yeah. as well? Like... Use of the stage is very important. You're covering all those points, okay? Because you're the director. Is that the dramaturge okay. or does that costume? The dramaturge, once again, would say, well, look, you know, we'd have to think about costume. We'd have to think about how they're going to relate to the audience and to the set, okay? okay. Don't forget, presentational drama is all about relating to the audience. Okay, remember that. I mean, you just did that play. We went into the audience with microphones. We dragged audience members up. Remember that, okay? Um, and then shift to representational scene between Alex and Jess. So how are you going to do that shift, all right? Depending on which, which thing you're going to do. Because if you're a director, you're going to stop audience interaction and you're going to focus on, once again, because don't forget, audience role is really important. The audience here is going to shift from being, um, from being active to being passive. You know, that's important because in realistic, they're no longer involved in being part of the production. They're not only spoken to directly, it's just the two characters having dialogue and the audience is irrelevant. So it's a shift in the way that you're going to stage that and the way you're going to present that. Okay? Now, this information that I give you, I keep pounding into your heads. It's the same all the time. Nothing has changed in the way I've said this thing to you. And I will continue to say this to you all year. This is the processes that we follow. It's very simple. It's just understanding what a, what a role is, what a person needs to do in their role, and then understanding what the style is and understanding what each style dictates in terms of what people wear, what happens on stage, to what happens with the audience and how we react to the audience. Good morning, staff. Just okay. one announcement before the recess bell. Okay. Just to remind